Good morning. Welcome to St. John Hill Church. My name is Dave Bittler. I'm the pastor here. If you're visiting with us this morning, I wish you a special welcome. Thank you for worshiping with us today. A couple of announcements before we uh, begin. Um, if you'd like to uh, help out with the uh, Ernie Haas concert, uh, the sign-up is actually in the, um, in the hallway directly behind me. It's up high, so look up. Um, uh, and you, you can see it there if you'd like to help out. I know Rick would appreciate uh, any help with that. Um, also, remember your, uh, the slips in your pews. The colored slip is for prayer requests, and these come uh, directly to me after the service, and that way I can be praying for them during the week. Uh, the white um, slip is for suggestions, and we uh, review those at our monthly uh, consistory meetings. Um, partly out of a suggestion that we received, um, you may have noticed that we keep having more children showing up here. And that's a beautiful thing, um, but it also means that um, we, we need to be also looking ahead uh, for things. And so on Sunday, May 5th, uh, for um, parents with children 18 and under, we would invite you to stay for uh, a meeting with us after church. Uh, we'll, we'll have lunch, but we, we want to hear from you uh, as to what we are doing well, what we can be doing uh, better, other things that you would like to see us uh, be able to help you um, in raising your children uh, in the Lord uh, here at the church. And so, um, uh, and this will be a good chance if... Uh, if you all don't know each other, it'll be a good chance to, to, to meet and greet there, but we would love to hear from you. So um, there's a sign-up sheet in the narthex uh, out back. If you can just sign up and you know, let us know how many are coming so we can prepare um, uh, enough food for everybody, we would appreciate that, uh, but we'd love if you could help us um, with that. Other announcements that we need to make this morning? I also remember seeing the, um, uh, the Sight and Sound show. If you signed up for that, um, when we first started talking about that, that was back in you know, December, January, and we thought, you know, April's a long way away. Well, it's next week. Uh, so a week from Tuesday is that show. Uh, so please don't, especially if you paid, please don't forget to show up here at uh, uh, 8.30 on this Tuesday the 16th and uh, we'll enjoy a good day together. Let us uh, prepare our hearts for worship then as we hear the prelude.
call to worship, which comes from Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Would you join me as we sing our opening hymn, Come, Christians Join to Sing. It is number 143 in the brown hymnal. The words will also be on the wall behind me. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. As we come again to the Heidelberg Catechism for this week, Question 35 asks, why do you confess, what do you confess when you say that he, Jesus, was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary? Let's answer the question together. The eternal Son of God, who is and remains true and eternal God, took upon himself true human nature from the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, through the working of the Holy Spirit. Thus he is also the true seed of David, and like his brothers in every respect, yet without sin. And what benefit do you receive from the holy conception and birth of Christ? Let us answer. He is our mediator and with his innocence and perfect holiness covers in the sight of God my sin in which I was conceived and born. And it is to Christ that we come now. In a time of confession, I would ask that you would take your bulletin or follow on the wall behind me. Let us pray together the prayer of confession, after which we'll take a few moments in silent prayer to confess our own personal sins to the Lord. I'll then close us in prayer and offer us some words of assurance. Let us pray together. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned against you by what we have done 
and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not fully loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not always had in us the mind of Christ. You alone know how often we have grieved you by wasting your gifts, by wandering from your ways. Forgive us, we pray, most merciful Father, and free us from our sin. Renew in us the grace and strength of your Holy Spirit, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Let's take a few moments in silent prayer this morning. Great and mighty God, we praise you that Christ has ascended to rule at your right hand. We rejoice before the throne of his power and peace, for he has put down tyrannies that would destroy us and unmasked idols claiming our allegiance. We thank you that he alone is Lord of our lives. By your spirit, give us freedom to love with his love and to embrace the world with his compassion. Accept the offering of our lives that we may obey your commands to serve in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear these words of assurance from Titus chapter 3. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let's sing together the doxology. Gratitude for all that God has done for us. Let us take up our morning's tithes and offerings. I'll ask our ushers to please come forward. Thank you. 
Help us to be generous givers, dear Lord, both with our money and our lives, that we might make a difference in our community. We ask this through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave all that was, that we might know life in all its fullness. Amen. Please remain standing as we continue to sing. I had a bit of a quandary. 
after we finished Ephesians, I really didn't know where to go. I mean, it's obviously a lot of material that we could touch on uh, next, and um, I ultimately decided on the letter of 1 John. So if you'd like to turn there, uh, it's toward the end of the Bible. You can find it on page 1021 of your pew Bibles, but if you're using your own Bible, just go to Revelation and back up uh, a couple of books. Right before that, you'll find Jude and then the three letters written by the Apostle John. Nearly, it was probably more than 10 years ago now, I discovered uh, as I was finishing seminary and um, looking for my first pastoral position, um, found that I got called to preach at a lot of different churches and sometimes on very short notice. And so one of the things that we, uh, you know, one of the tricks of the trade, as it were, is we were always taught to make sure that you have a sermon in your back pocket. And so I always considered First John, especially the first five verses, to be my pocket sermon that I could walk in anywhere and talk about this uh, particular passage. What I love about it is that, again, this is written by the disciple John, the, the disciple that Jesus loved. And he writes his gospel, and he, he is now an old man, reflecting on what it means to have lived a life affected by Jesus Christ. And he's writing to congregations that know him, that he loves. And you notice how many times he, you know, he'll call them his beloved, my dear children in the faith. This is like you know, a letter from your grandfather wishing you well in instructing you on your journey. Let us hear God's word to us today. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Let's pray. Almighty God, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, as we come before your word this morning, we long to hear and to be taught by you. Help us, O Lord, in these few moments that we have today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of us, as we get older, we have regrets. One of the biggest regrets that I have is that I didn't sit down with my grandparents to listen to more stories. They had a lot. On my, on my mom's side, my my grandfather was born in 1917. My grandmother was born in 1921. They had seen a lot. My grandfather lived to be 85. My grandmother lived to be 94. I missed out on hearing more of what life was like when they were living on the farm. I, I would hear some of them from my brothers. They would tell me. You know, my, my oldest brother told me the day when he was probably 
11 or 12, and he was told to take the tractor someplace, and he ended up getting the tractor stuck, which, if you know my brother, he can find ways to, to do things that nobody else would do, and he couldn't get it unstuck, so he had to come back to the farmhouse and, and you know, you know, tell my grandmother, you know, we got the tractor stuck, we're going to have to, you know, take something else up to pull it out. And my grandmother, who, you know, on her best day was about four foot eleven and might have weighed about 80 pounds soaking wet, said, we'll see about that. My grandmother went and she got the tractor unstuck. <sighs> never wanted to mess with that woman. She was, like I said, she was just a little woman, but I, I, I was never going to cross her because she was tough. And I knew she had lots of stories. Here, John is now this old man. He has seen a lot. He has seen Jesus walk on the earth. He's seen Jesus feed 5,000. He's seen Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration with Moses and Elijah. He's seen Jesus crucified. He's seen Jesus risen from the dead. He's seen the church of Jesus Christ expand from a little village in Palestine to now covering much of the Roman Empire and even into Africa. And so he's writing this letter to the church in much the same way as he begins his gospel account. If you remember when John begins his gospel, back in the gospel of John, chapter 1, he begins it in much the same way. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he begins this letter in a reminder saying, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. It's like my children... I'm not writing to you some made-up story. I'm writing to you about what I have actually done. Here is what I have seen. Not only have I seen it, but I've touched it. See, here's the thing. The story for John is its own power. That's why he wrote his gospel. At the end, he tells us, he says, I've written these things so that by hearing them, you may believe in the one who has eternal life. See, our stories here in this life, you know, my grandmother lived to be 94. She had a lot of stories. She'd seen a lot of things. And John being, you know, probably in his 90s, 80s, 90s at this point, has seen a lot of things, but he's more concerned about the eternal story. It's like there's a story that's going to go on forever. And I want you to be a part of that story. I want you to be acquainted with the one who has eternal story. Life. The life was made manifest. We have seen it. We testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was from the Father and was made manifest to us. So this is reminiscent back, if you remember, in the book of Acts, after Peter preached at Pentecost, and Peter and John were coming before the religious leaders and they're saying, hey, you got to stop talking about this Jesus. And what did John say? He said, we cannot help 
but to talk about what we have seen and heard. That same language that he says in the book of Acts, he uses here in this letter, he's talking about we have the story. We know what really happened. And that story is important. It's important for us to pass it down. It's important for us to you, for you to have and to hold and to identify with. Because it really happened. It was tangible. It was real. And that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you can have fellowship with us. Why do we tell the stories? Because we just want the family to get bigger. Family can never be big enough. I'm glad that our family here at Hill Church is growing. I mean, if you missed it, two weeks ago, we added 14 new members to our family. The previous two years, we added a total of 16. Those two years, we did 14 this year. Praise God, the family's growing. And I didn't see anybody sad that day. <laughs> like Palm Sunday, we bring in 14 new members. Nobody walked out going like... This is a real bummer. <laughs> right? People were like, did you see that? Did you see how many people came? I was like, yeah, that's it. That's the joy that John is saying. This is our joy. When, when people join the family, our joy is complete. What I love about this passage, what I love about what John is commending to us here is because this is what I figured out when I started talking to people about their tattoos. I've told you this many times. If I walk up to somebody on the street and I say, hi, I'm Pastor Dave, can we talk? Generally, the response is uh, no. In fact, you know, I told you the story. I was in the, walking in the park one day, and I saw this young woman. She had tattoos on both arms. And I walked up to her, and before I even got there, she just put her hand up and went like this. She said, I don't want any. I'm not interested. I'm an atheist. She said that just because I had the word God on the shirt that I happened to be wearing. I was wearing one of our Mission Trip Birdsboro t-shirts. So it's God's will, our heart. She saw the word God, and she saw me coming, and she's just like, been there, done that, don't want to talk about it. I said, that's not why I'm here. And I had, I had my card up that says, does your tattoo have a story? I said, can you read this? She said, what's it say? I said, does your tattoo have a story? I said, I just want to talk about your ink. She looked at me, she said, that's all you want? I said, that's all I want. I just want to hear your story. And the next words out of her mouth were, oh, well, what do you want to know? Completely changed. She had a story. And it was put on her skin in art. And it was a story that wanted to be told. It was heart-wrenching. When she told me her story, I felt like I'd just been kicked in the gut. of the horrible things that this poor girl endured. She has a story. We went to Daytona a month ago. <coughs> Pastor that I'm with, <laughs> I knew that Daytona was going to be a little much for him. The lights, the sounds, very loud, lots of things to see. We were only in downtown Daytona Beach for about 15 minutes before I could tell he had had about his fill of what his natural processing brain could, could take. He's just like, could we just find a place to get some dinner? 
So we choose this little diner on Main Street, not far from the ocean. We go and we sit down, and here comes this very beautiful, bubbly waitress, and she's got tattoos. And I just sit back, and I'm just like, all right, go for it. I didn't tell him this. I just I was going to wait for him to do it. And he asked, and boy, was she ready to tell her story. He said, I've got, I've got two girls and I've got a boy. It's for my husband. This was for my stepdad. He passed away during COVID. He said, but he was my real dad. He was the one that raised me. But the story goes on and she begins to tell us about how she had been addicted to drugs, but she came to Daytona Beach to get clean. Now, for my pastor friend who's there with us, he grew up in Florida, and this is, this is completely blowing his mind because he's just like, Daytona Beach is where people go to run away. It's where the runaways go. It's like she came here to get clean. She said, I got off drugs. She said, I, I have an apartment right here near the restaurant. She said, I'm working. She said, I have a relationship with my kids. I have a relationship with my husband. She said, I had to get clean for me. I couldn't, it didn't, I couldn't do it for them. I had to do it for me. She led us into her story. Her story was going someplace. It was a story that she was just dying to tell. She wanted to know, is anybody listening to my story? And when she had said that her stepdad had passed away, the man that had raised her, it became very clear to me the only thing that I needed to do was I looked at her and I said, I just want to tell you one thing. I'm proud of you. Because I think that's what her stepdad wanted her to hear. I'm proud. And with those few words, I could see in her eyes, she got the message. She had needed somebody to validate her. And then I did something that I very rarely do in these situations. I looked at her and I said, do you know what it is that we do? She goes, no. I said, we're both pastors. You're what? I said, we're pastors. I said, we're proud of you. We love you. Thank you for sharing your story with us. And I could see that the wheels were turning. Right? She was trying to process what we had just told her. How is that going to factor into her story? Quite honestly, I don't know. I think that it will. Maybe one day in heaven I'll get to hear the rest of the story. Our stories are important. And when we are, we can take the time to enter into someone else's story, we are showing them Love. We are actually showing them a taste of the gospel of Christ. Because the only way that we can do that effectively is if we understand this story. See, when we participate in the Lord's table, this is a reenactment of a story. It's a story that says, Jesus Christ came. His body was broken for me. His blood was shed for me. I remember the story. And the only way that I can partake of this story, of this meal, is to say that my story has intersected with this story and my story changed. When my story intersects with the story of Christ, it goes in a completely different direction.
because this feeds my soul. And it's leading me toward eternal life. What Jesus calls us to do, to go into the world and to preach the gospel, is to say, go into the world and, and tell my story. But in order to tell his story effectively to someone, it helps to know their story. Because our goal is to get the story of Jesus and their story to meet. Somewhere it's got to meet. In Daytona Beach, before, right before we went into the restaurant, a man came walking by us on the street and he was holding a sign that said, Jesus saves. And he was passing out a tract to us. And so I stopped him. And I said, and I thanked him for, for what he was doing. I said, we're pastors too. I said, we've come to listen to the stories underneath the tattoos of the people here. Doing what? I said, we've come to listen to the stories of the tattoos. I said, we found that people will, will talk to us more frequently if, if we let them tell us something about themselves first. In this poor, I could tell I was just blowing his brain. It's like, I've never heard of that before. I said, no, probably not. It's, we're still kind of new at this. We're, we're, we're learning our way through. See, what we found is people are wondering is there anybody willing to listen? to my story. And here's the thing. We as Christians, when we encounter people, we are literally being Christ to them. And if our first inclination is to go up to somebody and say, let me tell you about Jesus. Not a bad inclination, something that we definitely need to do. But do you know what happens to them? They immediately go into fight or flight mode. Right? That's what happens physiologically in their brain. Because they, they perceive that we are coming to debate them. Let me tell you why you're wrong. Let me tell you why I'm right. And so what does the brain do? It's either going to be like, I'm either going to argue very heavily or I'm going to tolerate as much as I can until I can run away. But when I come to somebody and say, I really like your tattoos. Is there a story there? See, science has done an experiment and this will make a lot of sense when you consider about the, the upcoming presidential election. You know what happens before and after debates? Almost nothing. The needle doesn't hardly ever move in a debate. You know why? Because the brain in a debate is not in a place where it can be persuaded. Where the brain enters into a space where it can be persuaded is when it enters into empathetic listening. Science actually did experiments with somebody telling a story and then somebody hearing a story. And what they found was that the brain waves of the storyteller and the brain waves of the listener started to sync up. There was no fight or flight. They were entering into the stories of each other. And in fact, the 
brain waves of the listener be, would begin to anticipate the changes that were coming in that of the storyteller. And they've determined that that's where persuasion can happen. It begins with listening. Why has it taken us so long to figure this out? I think we've known it all along. We've heard the story of Jesus. Right? Somewhere in your life, you heard the story of Jesus, and it made a change. But probably since that time, if it's been any number of years, things have happened in people's lives now that are wondering, for a myriad of reasons, is God really listening to me? When I pray, is God even there? Is God really listening to me? And part of the reason that they ask that question is because they encounter Christians who only want to talk to them and don't want to listen. And their perception is, well, God must only be interested in telling me what I'm doing wrong. And he's not interested in listening. When we go to people with a listen first narrative, we want to say, I want to listen to your story. With no judgment, no agenda, that flips the script. And they begin to think, maybe God will listen to me too. Maybe God will listen to me when I'm struggling. Maybe God will listen to me when I pray. Maybe God will listen when I'm crying out because right now I don't feel like he does. This story tells us that God listens. He hears the cries of our hearts, and he entered into the story for us. He didn't leave us to finish the story after the garden on our own. He sent Jesus to enter into our story to show us the way home. Our job in helping other people hear the story to, to understand what it is that we found starts with us shutting up and showing people that we can listen, that God will listen to them. And here's the thing. I cannot change someone's heart, but the Holy Spirit can. That's his job. If I try to do that, I'm going to fail because I am not the Holy Spirit. I, he does the job much better than I do. I can enter into the story and say, I want to hear your story. And eventually, they're going to start to process their story. Eventually, they're, start going, to, they're going to figure out my story too. And my story starts here. And the Holy Spirit will work with that. Because if they see Jesus in me, they'll start to believe that they could see Jesus in themselves too. That's the power of story. And stories only have power if somebody listens to them. As a young person, I didn't take the time to listen to the stories of my grandparents. It is something that I regret now. Let's not regret not listening to the stories of the people that pass by us every day. Because there's important stories out there that are just dying to be listened to. Dying to hear. And those are stories that Jesus died to enter into as well. So as we prepare to come and 
remember the story of Jesus. Let's begin by affirming our faith together. By reciting the Apostles' Creed, what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This table tells a great story. And if your story, the story of your life, has intersected with the story of this table, then this celebration, this remembrance, is for you. Maybe today is the day where your story will finally intersect with the story of this table. Maybe this is the day which you're going to say, I want my life, to, my life story to take a new direction, the direction toward reconciling with God. So maybe today's the day where you can take this for the first time for yourself and say, I believe what this says, and I want this story to be my story. But if today's still not that day, if you're not there yet, just let this time pass by. Because the Bible instructs us that if, if we're declaring something up that's part of our story that's not actually true in our hearts, that that would actually invite God's judgment into your life. And I wouldn't want you to be doing that. With that, would you join me in prayer? Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord God. Let's sing together the hymn. Almighty God, as we come before this table to remember the story of Jesus Christ, to remember what he has done for us, how his story has changed our story, would you take these common elements and would you bless them, would you set them apart from their common purpose to this special purpose that you have ordained, that as we celebrate this today, we look forward to the day when we will celebrate this with you in the new heavens and the new earth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on 
the night he was betrayed, he took bread, unleavened bread because it was near the time of Passover. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you have your cup and you pull back on the top layer of cellophane, it will reveal the bread. This is the body of Christ that was broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of him. After supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. If you pull back on the larger tab, it will reveal the cup. The blood of Christ, the blood of the new covenant, which was shed for you, take and drink. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the power of this story and the grace that it holds for us. Father, would you fill us with that grace? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, well, let's take these and any unspoken requests that you have to the Lord in prayer this morning. Almighty God, as we consider your word, we consider the truth of the story of Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have made us a part of your family, that you have shown us the way of victory through the death of your Son. Father, would you help us to share that grace, to be true ministers of your gospel of peace, Lord, as we have lifted up many here before you this morning who need your touch and your care. Father, we ask you also to search our hearts and to help us to cast our burdens upon you. Lord, again, help us to be ministers of your peace. Help us to enter into the stories of the people we meet each day, that their stories would be drawn closer to the story of Jesus. We ask all of this in his name, who taught his disciples and so us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In response to God's word, would you stand for our closing hymn? It's number 470 in the brown hymnal, Victory in Jesus.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.